find that in life, we just don't like things that are lukewarm. Uh, They're just not appealing to us, the things that are uh, lukewarm. Nobody likes a lukewarm cup of coffee or hot chocolate. Matter of fact, we don't like many things that are simply just half-hearted or lukewarm in life. Imagine if you're an employer and you're looking for a brand new person to work for you. Do you want somebody that's kind of half-hearted, can really care less whether they're there or not? Or do you want somebody that is enthusiastic, totally committed, and man, they're ready to serve and do whatever it takes? Man, you don't want one that's lukewarm, half-hearted. What about you need a surgery? And you find out that your surgeon comes to the hospital in his golf shirt, golf shorts, carrying a 12-ounce liter of Coke, and he comes into the operating room and he says, let's get this over with. I've got things to do. Man, you want a doctor like that, a surgeon like that, or you got one that comes in and says, man, I've been studying, I've been looking over the x-rays, the charts, and, and I've been preparing myself for this surgery. See, we don't want a half-hearted surgeon, one that's not totally committed. What about somebody that's getting married? Do you want somebody that when they meet you at the front of the church, at the altar, that are totally dedicated, devoted, given to you? Or do you want to marry someone that's kind of like, "Mm, oh, well, take it or leave it. I guess it'll be fine. And see, we don't want half-hearted. We we don't want lukewarm. If you have an emergency situation, do you want somebody that's lukewarm saving your life? Do you want somebody that, you know, is not really into it? Or do you want somebody that is dedicated, devoted, committed to saving lives? You see, we don't like things that are half-hearted or lukewarm. But we're not the only ones that feel this way. For even our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, speaks about his distaste for half-hearted believers. And we're going to be confronted with the question today as we leave, are we a half-hearted, lukewarm believer? Take your Bibles, if you would, and we're going to be looking in the third chapter of the book of Revelations. Revelations chapter 3, and we're going to begin our study with verse 14. Revelations chapter 3, beginning in verse 14. Notice what the word of the Lord has for us today. And to the angel of the church of Laodicea write, the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this. I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot, and I would that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you. Some of your translations have, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you're wretched, miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire, that you may become rich, and white garments, that you may clothe yourself, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed." And I salve to anoint your eyes that you will see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into him and will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me at my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. 
he who has ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. May God add his blessing to the reading and the studying of his word this morning. We find that Jesus addresses uh, the seven churches of Revelations. And we're going to look at the last church, the seventh church of the church of Revelation. And we're going to be confronted with the question, am I a lukewarm believer? That's a question that we're going to have to ask ourselves today when we leave. Am I simply a lukewarm, half-hearted believer? Because we see what Christ's attitude towards that was. That he says, I, I will spit you, I, I will spew you, I will vomit you out of my mouth. We see, first of all, as we look through this passage, you look in your talk notes, the location of the church. The last church of the Revelations mentioned is the church of Laodicea, and you see that in verse 14. Of the seven churches we find, this church geographically sits to the far east of all the different churches. We have a map on the screen right now that, that you can see. It's a far more eastern church than the rest of the churches. We find the church was located in the Lycus Valley, and it's close proximity of the churches were the church of Colossae, Hierapolis. And the church at Laos City has this distinct notation that we find in the book of Revelation is this, that it stands out as the only church that Jesus says nothing good about. Not one accommodation about the church. Not one thing that he says about the church that he says, man, you've got it right. You're doing it well. You're doing it good. Not one does he mention one thing about this church that he praises, says anything good, anything right about this church. So they have that distinction. They were the only church of the seven churches that he says it about. It was a very important city. Because it was located in the Lycus Valley. Look at the next slide. You'll see some of the ruins there that were left behind. And because it was located in the Lycus Valley, it meant that it was for travel, it was easier to go through the valley naturally than it was to go through the mountains. And it became such an important city in that region for one reason only. If any of you are in real estate, you know this rule. Location Location, location. Major roads pass through it going west to east, east to west, and different roads that were leading north and south through this area. And so the location of this made this city such an important city in the world. We find there are three distinctive marks about the city that I want to point out to you. Each of them speaks about what Christ says to the church. The first thing that we want to point out, it's interesting, is that there was a significant Jewish population. Because of some finds that we found in that area, an archaeological study, that we find there was at least 7,500 Jewish men. That's not counting women or children. So we know there was a pretty significant, healthy population of Jewish people living in this region at that time. But the second characteristic that stands out about Laodicea, it was known for being a banking and financial center. It was a wealthy, wealthy town. I mean, wealth found its place there. Because of the banking centers, the financial and dealings that took place there, this was a very wealthy town that happened. And just to show you how wealthy it was, in 61 AD, there was a massive earthquake that occurred there. Devastated the community there. Rome heard about it, and Rome said that we will help you rebuild your town. Kind of like what happens in the United States. Uh, when there's a major storm or a major crisis, that we find that the U.S. government sends in their help to help to rebuild, to give loans. 
Well, Rome did the same thing. And what is interesting that Laodicea said, we don't want your help. Not that they were thumbing uh, Rome, but they said, we can do it ourselves. They were so wealthy at that time. They said, we don't need any outside help. We have enough wealth to build it back ourselves. And they did. One of their great Roman historians, Tacus, said, writes, and he says this, one of the most famous cities in Asia, Laodicea, was in the same year overthrown by an earthquake and without any relief recovered itself, listen, by its own resources. A very wealthy place. But the third thing that we notice about this city, it was famous for the clothing industry. They had a clothing industry there because they were famous for their black, glossy wool that came off the sheep that lived in the mountains around them. And they were known for making outer garments and carpet. And they would export these things out of the city to places in the world. And they were known for it. But it was interesting that Jesus said to them, as he spoke to the church, you are naked. But as he spoke to the church also about the great finances they had, he said, you are poor. The, third, the fourth thing that we find about the city that stands out and is probably best known for this was for their medical facilities that they had there. It was known worldwide at the time for their medical facility in which they had. When I first moved to Paris, one of the things the pulpit committee said, hey, this area is known for their medical facilities. At that time, we had two when I moved here. And they said, we have good medical facilities and we have good doctors here. Well, the world knew that the same thing for that. And they were best known out of this medical facility. They produced eye salve and ear salve. And they would uh, ship that to places all over the world. And it was made from the tephrar which is the, the residue that comes out of the volcano in the region of Phrygia. And they would take that and they would fold it, make it into little tablets, and they would ship those tablets off. And you would take the tablet and you would grind it up and mix it with water and turn it into a salve that you would use for your eyes and for your ears. The doctors that were there, some of them were so famous as the Laodicea had their coins, they put the names of the doctors on the coins themselves. But Jesus said about them, about the church, he said, you're blind. Even though they were famous worldwide for this cream, they, Jesus says to them, they're blind. In the city itself, they had everything going their way, location, location. They were a financial center, a banking center for the world, world uh, wool production, eye salve, and it seemed like they had everything going their way except one thing, and that was water. Water was a problem because of the population as it continued to grow and grow, people were drawn to that city. There was just not enough water source to meet the needs, and in fact, they were in the valley, remember, the Lycus Valley, the Lycus River that went through the valley in the dry season. At times, it would dry up, and there was no water. Archaeologists have found they had aqueducts, underground aqueducts to bring water in. It was interesting that the cities that were close by them, Colossae, were known for their fresh, cold water. It was water that was refreshing. But the other city that was called by, Hierapolis, was known for their springs of hot water that were known for their medicinal purposes that people would go there, like Hot Springs, Arkansas, and different places where people would seek out these springs. But Laodicea had none. And so they built these aqueducts to bring in water into their city. And by the time that it got to the city, traveling some six miles or so, that the water became tipid. It wasn't warm, it wasn't cold, it was just tipid. But in time, in the aqueducts, they filled up with mineral deposits, 
and it's uh, constricted the flow of water, but those mineral deposits gave a, a taste to the water. It, it wasn't a water that was refreshing to drink and uh, that was good to drink. It was a water that was tippet and it, it had a taste to it. And so we find there, there was problems there. One writer writes this about the water. He said the neighboring Hierapolis had hot springs valuable for its mineral and medicinal effects. In its journey to Laodicea, it lost, this, uh, it lost its healing powers and consequently it became water that was tepid. And nearby Colossae, he writes, had cool, life-giving water that was refreshing as a beverage, but it lost, it lost it when it got to the city. But Jesus had a word for the church that was there at Laodicea. I want you to notice in verse 14, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we find some characteristics about the Lord Jesus that is listed, three characteristics. The first one, he describes himself there. Notice what it says in verse 14, and the angel of the church of Laodicea, right? The I am. We find that Jesus calls himself the I am. That was a title that we find in the Old Testament for God in Isaiah 65, verse 16. The word I am in the Hebrew language means truth. And so what Jesus is saying to them, I am the truth. To know me is to know truth. In the New Testament, we find it this way. It says, I am what? I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Jesus said, I am the truth. And he reveals himself to the church there at Laodicea. And he says, listen, you need to know this. I am the truth. But notice what he reveals secondly to the church. He says these words, the faithful and true witness. Jesus is saying there, not only am I truth, but what I speak is truth. And so the words that I'm going to speak to you, Laodicea, are truth. These are not half-truths, some baked-up idea. But when I proclaim what I'm saying to you, Laodicea, I am speaking to you out of truth who I am. I am speaking to you now that which is truth. So listen up. Pay attention. I'm speaking truth to you. And then the third characteristics that we find about him, he says this, the beginning of God's creation. In the English, that's kind of hard to understand. In the English, you would read it and you might interpret it this way, that Jesus is the first created being of what God created. Look at it again. That's kind of what it seems it would be saying in the English. But we understand from other scripture references, we know that's not true. And so what is it saying? Well, the Greek word there for beginnings, you need to look at that. Look at the word beginnings. Is a Greek word called archie. We would say it that way, archie. It means Jesus is the source. The word means source of creation, meaning this, that Jesus is the one that was a part of creation. He created what we see, and we find that to be true in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. It says, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority, all things have been created by him and for him. And Jesus now tells the church his characteristics. He wanted them to know who he was that was speaking. And he said, I am the truth. I'm going to tell you the truth. And I'm over all creation. And he says, the one that is the I am, the one that is truth, is speaking to you truth. So church, listen up to the message that I have for you. The third thing that we find is the lukewarm church. I want you to notice these words in verse 17 that really begins to describe what a lukewarm church is. In verse 17, 
find these words, we need nothing. We need nothing. Lord, we've got it all under control. Like the city told Rome, Rome, we need nothing. We don't need your help. We know what we want to do. We know where we're going. Rome, we don't need you. Now the church is taking what they've heard in the city and bringing it into the church. And what they're saying is, Lord, we don't need you. Lord, we need nothing. We are self-sufficient without you. Great offerings, <coughs> great parking lots, great ministry, great activities. Man, the town is growing. Lord, we don't need you. That is when a church becomes lukewarm, half-hearted. That's when a people of God become half-hearted, when they say with their mouths or with their hearts, with their lifestyle, God, I'm not dependent upon you. I can go days, I can go weeks without reading your word, without praying, being on my knees. Man, I don't need you, God. I've got my life under control. And God, I don't even need to come to Sunday worship because God, I don't need you. Man, I can be just as close to you under a tree, out in a bush, in a tree stand. God, I don't need you. And anytime we begin to act and to play out in our lives that we don't need God, we have become a church of Laodicea. We've become a half-hearted church. And remember we said the city itself had problems with water and they had to bring it through underground aqueducts into the city. And when they got it, man, it wasn't refreshing like Colossae or was it warm like Hyperbolus? But when it got there, it was tipped and it was tainted by uh, the mineral buildup in the aqueducts. And when you would drink it, 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 it wouldn't be anything that you would desire. And Jesus says, when I taste you as a church, Laodicea, it makes me want to vomit. It makes me want to spew you out. Man, that, that tippedness of your lifestyle, it makes me sick. But what is a half-hearted church? What does half-heartedness mean? What does it mean to be lukewarm? I defined it this way. I define a lukewarm believer this way. They have enough of Jesus to be satisfied with him, but not enough to be compelled to be consumed by him. You have enough of him to fit in with the Christian circles and not enough of him to keep you from living in the world. A lukewarm Christian is that one who lives a compromised life. It's one who rides the fence. Just don't want Jesus, listen, to interfere with your life. I want Jesus. I want that good feeling that Jesus gives, but I don't want him interfering in my life. Man, I don't want him to tell me that I need to give up something, that I need to do something that I need to repent about something in my life. Man, I just want to ride the fence. I just kind of want to get through life without any difficulties. And if Jesus won't interfere with my life, I will be happy and satisfied. And that kind of lukewarm believer makes Jesus sick at his stomach. So the question I, I've got to ask you and I've got to ask myself, are you a lukewarm believer? Are you one that is just lukewarm, that you just shifted it into neutral? Man, you don't want to be bothered by anything. You don't want to be, have, you know, anything to bother you, to put a hindrance on your life. You just want to put it in neutral and just kind of coast through. You don't want to serve on any committees. You don't want to be active in your Sunday school. You don't want to do anything evangelistically. You just want to put it in neutral and just kind of sail with the current until the day that you die. Is that you? Show up for Easter? Show up for Christmas? Show up when there's something special at church, a special meal, 
a special speaker. Man, we'll go to that. But man, everything else that we just kind of lay it off to the side. Maybe we just go to church only, Sunday school only. Man, we just do the minimal to just get by because we don't want to get bothered. Is that the story of your life? See, we're in a series about loving God. We can't love God the way that we want to if he wants to spew us out of his mouth. We can't be a half-hearted believer or more is your half-heartedness defined like this, that you're living a compromised life. On Sundays, you're one pitcher. You get cleaned up and put a little woof-woof juice on. But on Mondays and Tuesdays, man, you're a different person. Your language is crude. The things that you do, the things that you're involved in, you're living a compromised life. At school, we've got students here, so proud of Jonathan. I think they had 40-something um, Wednesday night. That You come to the worship service, you come to Wednesday night, but at school, nobody knows you're a believer. The teachers, the administrators, the other students would be shocked to know that you go to First Baptist Church. You're living a half-hearted life. And Christ says that kind of life makes me sick. That kind of lifestyle of not being hot with me or cold and refreshing with me, just being tipid. He said, that lifestyle, I just want to spew that out. I don't like it. But is that what you're living right now, you as a believer? Half committed, half-hearted. I remember one of the richest churches that I ever pastored in my life was in western Oklahoma, a small church, my first pastorate. I had several multi, multi, multi millionaires there. But at times I would teach the class or be available and I, I would see what the men give. Not that I was going through the records, but I would just see their envelopes. Many of them gave $25 week after week after week. Man, that was great in the 50s when they first got saved and went to that church. But after they became multi, multi millionaires, they, they just kept giving the half-hearted tip. They feel like they needed a tip, throw it in. But I want to ask you today in the attic on the main floor right here as we gather, how many of you would know in your hearts and you would say, man, I'm really half-hearted. I'm not really all in. I'm not really consumed with the Lord being passionate with the Lord. I'm just skating along with him. How do you get out of that life? You see, Jesus comes to the church and he says, there's a lifeline. There's a way to get out if you want to. Notice their uh, fourth point, the lifeline which will rescue you from being a lukewarm Christian. Before we see the lifelines, I want you to listen to the comparison of what the church of Laodicea says about itself compared to what Jesus says about it. Listen to the comparison. The church of Laodicea says, I am rich. Jesus says, you're wretched. We find the church of Laodicea says, I need nothing. Jesus says, you are poverty stricken. We find that the church of Laodicea says, I have prospered. And Jesus says, you're blind blind. There's three lifelines that Jesus says to this church of how you get out. And it's the same way you get out of living a half-hearted Christian life, a lukewarm life. The first one is this, be willing to exercise your faith no matter the cost. Be willing to exercise your faith no matter the cost. Look what he says in verse 18 to them. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire that you may become rich. What is that gold he's talking about? What does it mean to be refined? We find in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17, it really helps us to understand it. It says that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire may be found as a result of praise and glory and honor at the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's what he's saying. You've got to stand in your faith. And no matter the cost, 
And as you are being refined there for standing your faith, the Lord is saying, I'm going to give you my gold. You see, they, they knew about riches. They knew about gold in that city, but they didn't know about the Lord's gold. And the Lord said, I'm going to honor you. I'm going to bless you with true gold, true riches. But you've got to be willing not to be half-hearted, lukewarm. You've got to be willing to stand in your faith no matter the consequences. You've got to be willing to stand where you are in your business, your neighborhood, and your home for Christ, no matter what the consequences that are coming out. Did you hear about what happened in Indianapolis? The baker that refused to bake a wedding cake for a same-sex marriage, they refused to. They were Baptist people. And they said, this goes against everything that we believe that is right. And they refused. They said, we won't do it. They began to protest and bring all sorts of national attention, and they finally had to close down their business. Here was somebody that was willing to stand for what was right. They were willing to stand in their faith, no matter the consequences that they lost a business in which they loved and poured their lives into. But I'm telling you, they were refined, they were tested, and they're going to receive the gold of Christ one day. Secondly, a lifeline for you. Be willing to live out your faith out loud. To be willing to live out your faith out loud. Notice what he says in verse 18. And white garments that you may clothe yourself. White garments that you may clothe yourself. In Revelation chapter 19 verse 8 it says, And it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. What he's saying is be willing to live out your faith out loud. Be willing to do the things that Christ has called believers to do, to show kindness and forgiveness, to be willing to get involved in lives of people that are hurting. He said live out your faith out loud. Be willing to get involved. Just don't sit on the sidelines and watch and applaud and clap. No, you get on the front lines and you live out your faith. He said that's your lifeline. That'll bring you back. But the third lifeline, look what he says. Be willing to see what I see. Be willing to see what I see. He says, and the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and an eye salve to anoint your eyes that you may see. What he's simply saying is, is that you may see what I see. Be willing to see the needs. Be willing to see the hurt. Be willing to see the lostness. Have the eyes of Christ of being willing to see. You could take these three lifelines and sum it up in three words. Stand, walk, and see. Stand in your faith. Walk the walk and see the needs around you. But before we conclude, I want you to notice verse 20. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into him and will dine with him and he with me. I want you to notice on the screen the famous painting by Holman Hunt. You've seen that painting many a time, but did you notice what the distinguishing feature of that painting is? That Jesus is knocking on the door. He's knocking on the door, but notice there's no handle on the door. No handle on the door. There's only one handle. It's on the inside. And the church of Laodicea, they have that handle. They're the only one that can open the door and, and let Christ in. And what a stark picture of a church that has Jesus outside in the parking lot knocking on the door because he can't get in because this church is a half-hearted, lukewarm church that says we need nothing, not even Christ do we need him. Today, will you repent? Would you be willing to do what Christ says and repent of your half 
heartedness, your lukewarmness to the Lord. It's not like some of you are, are committing any grave sin that is out there. You're just in neutral. But even though it's not like one of the big sins, Jesus says, man, it makes me want to vomit. But there's others of you that are compromising, living in the church, living in the world. Would you repent today in order that we truly might love God as God has asked us to love him? Would you repent and say, man, that's my life. Man, the Holy Spirit has nailed me today. I'm living a lukewarm life. Christian life. I don't want to get involved. I don't want to be bothered. I don't want Jesus bothering my life. I just want him to save me. And some of you need to repent today. It's a call for you to be hot for him. It's a call for you to be cold and refreshing for him. But please don't be like the church of Laodicea that leaves Jesus on the outside knocking to come in. You're the only one today that has the doorknob. You're the only one today that can ask Christ to truly take full control of your life and remove that half-hearted, lukewarm Christian life which he disdains. Will you open the door today in repentance and say, God, forgive me for the life that I'm living before you. He stands at the door and he knocks. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, one of the hardest scenes that we find anywhere in the Word of God to find Jesus outside of the church. A church that thought itself to be such a great church. But Jesus says that they are poor, they are blind, they're naked, they're tippid, they're lukewarm, half-hearted, compromised. And so, Father, we pray today that we would not be that church. But the only way that we cannot be that church, if we as individuals that meet here, are willing to repent of that in our own lives. So, Father, hear our cry. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. As your heads are still bowed and your eyes are still closed. Brother, sister in Christ, as your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, Are you living a half-hearted Christian life? The shame is, is that we don't have any redos in this life. Once our life is over, it's, it's done. It's over. Whether we live to 50 or 60, 70, 80, 90, once it's over, it's over. The critical thing is, is that you get it right now. And that's why we hold in our hands the letter to the church at Laodicea to remind us it can happen to your life so easily. I've seen it so many times when people's kids get out of the youth group. Man, they get out of church then, the parents. Man, they they just kind of slide, they coast, go in neutral. I've seen it of young people that come to church on Sunday and sing his name, but on Monday they're involved in all sorts of worldly activities in their lives in their date life, in their speech, the things they look at, the things they read, the things they share back and forth on Twitter and Facebook. Christ is speaking to your heart today. And some of you need to repent right where you are and say, Lord, man, that's me. Half-hearted, neutral. Take the easy way. But he's thrown the lifeline out to you. Will you come to him in repentance and say, Lord, I'm coming back. Man, I don't want to be one that Christ is, in a sense, outside knocking to get in. 
I'm not saying that he's left you, but in the sense he didn't have full control of your life. Man, what a picture. Only one doorknob. And will you today place your hand on the doorknob of your heart and say, Christ, you come in and take full control, full reins of my life. No more half-heartedness. No more being lukewarm. God set me to be hot. Set me to be cold for you. Don't leave me in that state where I'm no good to this earth. No good in my family in a sense because I'm so tippid in my faith. Father, I pray as we give this invitation that you will be glorified. Pray for those that need to come publicly and maybe gather around the altar and repent. Pray for those, Father, that need to come and unite with the church and those that, Father, since you're calling to surrender their lives for the first time, to make you their Lord of their lives. I pray today that they would come, and we pray this in Christ's name, amen, as we stand to our feet.